Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Imperial War Museums. My name is Jill Weber, and I'm the Executive Director of the IWM Institute. I just need to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. So, toilets are on level zero, so I advise you to take the lift, which is at the back of the museum, and then you have to walk all the way to the front of the museum. And uh, we're not expecting a fire alarm, so if one goes off, it's a real fire alarm. And please look to um, my colleagues, IWM members of staff, who will direct you. So the IWM Institute is IWM's uh, research and knowledge exchange hub. We provide access to our rich collections for research and innovation to increase the public understanding of war and conflict. We're very excited to welcome you to the IWM Institute 2024 annual lecture with Philippe Sands on war, genocide and other crimes. The annual lecture series invites the world's most prominent speakers to find solutions to the pressing conflict-related issues of today. Previous speakers include former UK Foreign Secretary David Miliband, who spoke about the refugee crisis, and celebrated historian Professor Margaret Macmillan, who spoke about how war has shaped society throughout history. This evening's event will feature the renowned human rights lawyer and UCL law professor, Philippe Sands. Philippe is a practicing bar barrister at 11 KBW, appears as counsel before the International Court of Justice and other international courts and tribunals, and sits as an international arbitrator. He is the author of best-selling books such as East West Street on the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide, as well as the rat line, Love, Lines, Lies and Justice on the Trail of a Nazi Fugitive. Following Philippe's address, there will be a short interview with Lindsay Hilsom, international editor for Channel 4 News, and then an opportunity for all of you to ask questions from the floor. I'd also like to welcome all our viewers around the world who are tuning in to watch the lecture on our live stream on YouTube. We'll also be staging several more events this year, including the power of the image, telling story of conflict through photography, an event to celebrate IWM's new Tim Hetherington exhibition, and featuring Sebastian Junger and James Brabazon. Please stay tuned for more information for future events on the IWM Institute website. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lindsay Hilson, Channel 4 News' international editor who has covered the major conflicts and refugee movements of the past three decades, including Syria, Iraq, Kosovo and Rwanda, winning several awards. Her new book, I Brought the War With Me, Stories and Poems from the Front Line, will be published in September. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you very much, Jill. And may I reiterate Jill's welcome to all of you and to all of you who are watching online. Welcome to the Imperial War Museum. As Jill has said, I, I'm a foreign correspondent. I'm often a war correspondent. Recently, I've been spending a lot of time in Ukraine and in Israel because we as foreign correspondents can't get into Gaza at the moment. Israel and the Egyptians won't, won't let us in. So I... Obviously, like everybody, I see a lot of social media, I read a lot, and I see a lot of words banded around more than ever before. Words like war crimes, crimes against humanity, and above all, genocide. I see it used all the time, and I see it used incredibly loosely, either to indicate that somebody is on one side or another side of a particular conflict, or because they want to show how horrible something is. And it is true. Absolutely horrible things are going on. Terrible things are happening to civilians, both in Ukraine and in Gaza and in Sudan, where I've been recently on the border with Chad. But the use of these very loose terms is not helpful because these are legal terms. These are terms with great meaning. And that is why I am so happy that we have Philippe Sands here tonight because Philippe is somebody who has studied the origins of genocide. And if you haven't read his book, East West Street, which is not just a historical analysis, but also takes back to his own family, his own family and the origins of the concept of, of genocide. So if you haven't read it, you must. I think you can buy it over there. And Philippe is someone who 
does not use words loosely because he really understands what they mean as an international lawyer. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the 2024 Imperial War Museum annual lecturer, Philippe Sands. Thank you very much, Lindsay. It's incredibly nice to be at the Imperial War Museum. I know this place pretty well. I've been coming here probably for more than 50 years. And it's one of those special places that, as kids, we actually loved coming to, unlike some of the other places, which I've, of course, come to appreciate hugely as I've gotten older. It's also incredibly nice to be here uh, with Lindsay. Can I just say at the outset that I'll go quite far in what I say, but as Lindsay will understand, and we haven't really coordinated, and there's quite a lot of overlap, I suspect there are certain things I can't get into so much detail or be quite so forthcoming about, because there are cases that are pending, which I am involved in, and we have a very sensible convention that when you're involved in cases, you tend not to speak about them publicly, largely because for very good reasons. Judges do not like it when counsel in cases go off and give lectures or speak to the media and do other things about matters that are pending before them. So please forgive me, particularly in relation to questions that may come later, which I hope they will come later. If I, if I, it's not that I sort of skirt around your questions, but I just want to be correct in addressing them. In part because, as Lindsay says, these are incredibly current, contentious, delicate issues which arouse enormous passions. And I want to, if you like, give you a little bit of context of how where we got to where we are. I've been involved in cases on the three existing international crimes that I'm going to talk about tonight. There is a fourth one, the crime of aggression, for many decades now. They are war crimes, which concerns the uh, methods and means of warfare, for example, the obligation not to target civilians. And that is a set of crimes that dates back at least to the middle of the 19th century. And then much more recently, the newly invented international legal crimes of crimes against humanity, which is essentially about the protection of individuals, and genocide, which is essentially about the protection of groups. I'd worked on a number of cases before international courts that raised these issues and taught these subjects at the universities that I've taught at for some time. Then in 2010, I received an invitation to give a lecture at a university that, frankly, I had never heard of, the University of Lviv in the Ukraine. I did a little bit of checking. They wanted me to come and talk about cases that I had done on crimes against humanity and genocide. And in the end, I accepted the invitation with incredible happiness and eagerness because I discovered that Lviv is the same place as Lvov, Leopolis, and Lemberg. And my grandfather was born in Lemberg in 1904. He left in 1914 when the Russians occupied the city and he moved to Vienna where he remained until 1939 when he moved to Paris and hence my French side. So having learned that my grandfather came from Lviv, which was a city I knew nothing about, I accepted the invitation, not actually because I had a burning desire to give a lecture on cases about crimes against humanity and genocide, but because I wanted to find my grandfather's house. That was the main reason for going. I found the house, which was incredibly exciting, uh, and in fact even more exciting was what I discovered on the way to preparing to go to Lviv in October 2010. And those were the two following things. I did a little bit of research on the origins of crimes against humanity and genocide, which I sort of knew about, but had never dug more deeply into. And I discovered, firstly, that the man who put crimes against humanity into the international legal order in the summer of 1945, on the 29th of July 1945, to be very precise, uh, in Cambridge when he met with Robert Jackson. His name was Hirsch Lauterpacht. He was the professor of international law at Cambridge University. And it was he who proposed that the statute of the Nuremberg trial be uh, include 
a new legal concept, crimes against humanity, related to his interest in the protection of the human rights of all human beings. And amazingly, he came from the city of Lviv. And even more amazingly, he was a student at the University of Lviv uh, from 1915 to 1919. And I thought, well, that'd be great. I'll turn up in Lviv and share with them the staggeringly interesting news that the origins of one of the crimes I'm talking about is from the city of Lviv. And then I carried on doing my research and was stunned to then discover that the man who invented the concept of genocide, literally invented it, Raphael Lemkin, first used in his November 1944 book, Axis Rule, uh, chapter nine of which is called genocide, a word he personally invented from the Latin and Greek words genus and sede, uh, the killing groups. He too studied at the very same university. Uh, he was not there at the same time. He was there from 1921 to 1926. And I thought this is really sort of astonishing to be invited to go to this place that you've never heard of and then discover that the very subject that you're going to talk about has its origins not only in that part of the world, not only in that city, not only in that university, but in the very room in which you're going to end up going uh, and meeting people. And so that story and that visit, which obviously has had a profound effect on me, uh, meant that I dug very deep into what it was about the city of Lviv that gave rise to the birth of these two concepts that are today, regrettably, so much a part of our lives. What was it about that city? And of course, war was a big part of what it was about that city. This was a part of the world that really knew about blood and brutality and killing and military conflict. This was a, a city which, in a single month, November 1918, changed hands four times. First week of November, it was part of Poland. Second week of November, it was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire again. Third week of November, it was part uh, of the short-lived Western Ukrainian Republic. And then fourth week, and then until 1939, when the Germans took over briefly and then handed over to the Soviets before the Germans came back, it was part of Poland. So it is a remarkable place. And essentially, it is a place that gave rise to these concepts because living in this remarkable city, whatever one calls it, were different communities. And what Lauterpacht and Lemkin shared in their ideas was the belief that rules of international law should be developed to protect human beings. They differed as to how that should be done. Lauterpacht's idea was you must focus on the well-being and the protection of every individual human being because they are an individual human being with minimum rights under international law. And that was articulated in his book on International Bill of Rights of Man, which became Crimes Against Humanity, Lemkin, on the other hand, said, no, that doesn't really work. It's not really worth focusing on individuals. They're important, obviously. What we should focus on is why people get killed at all and targeted. They don't get targeted because they've done something. They get targeted because of who they are. They get targeted because they happen to be a member of a group that is hated at a particular moment in time and place. So if we want to protect human beings, what we need to do is to protect the groups of which they are a member. Not a good idea, says Lauterpacht. The consequence of doing that is that you will replace the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of the group. And for the rest of their lives, they both died young in 1959 and 1960 respectively, they were essentially in a battle of ideas about the relationship between the individual and the group. They were both at Nuremberg. They were both part of the prosecution teams. Uh, Lauterpacht was with the British. Lemkin was with the Americans. It's incredibly touching for me that the remarkable and fabulous Holocaust rooms, the new Holocaust rooms in this fantastic museum, ends with almost life-size pictures of Lauterpacht and Lemkin and their stories. That is very moving uh, for me, and I'm very proud to have been associated uh, with that development because it places these aims of protecting the human, whether as an individual or as a member of group, at the heart of a museum that is concerned 
with war and militarization and conflict. And it makes that link between war and these new international crimes. So in 1945, the Nuremberg Judgment refers to crimes against humanity extensively, but it passes in total silence on the concept of genocide, which is raised in the arguments, but is in the end not addressed or even mentioned by the judges, largely because the Americans were against the idea. They were against the idea largely because of a group of southern US senators who worried that the concept of genocide would be used in relation to Native Americans and um, African Americans to challenge acts of lynching, to challenge acts of destruction that had taken place in earlier uh, periods. Uh, and so Robert Jackson came under intense pressure not to refer to the matter. And so genocide is not mentioned. Lemkin described the day of the Nuremberg judgment, the 1st of October 1946, passing in silence on his beloved concept of genocide as the darkest day in his life. Even more remarkably, actually, in terms of the Nuremberg trials, as I describe in the book, Anthony Beaver said, you couldn't invent it if you were a novelist, and I think he's right, was that Lauterpacht and Lemkin found themselves prosecuting the same individual, Hans Frank. Hans Frank had been Adolf Hitler's personal lawyer from 1928 to 1933. He eventually became governor general of Nazi-occupied Poland. Lauterpacht prosecuted him for crimes against humanity. Lemkin prosecuted him for genocide. What neither man knew was that this man, Hans Frank, was responsible for the killings of both of their entire families. And so the book East West Street, which Lindsay generously mentioned, tells the story of those three individuals, Lauterpacht, Lemkin and Hans Frank, and also my grandfather, who also came from the same city. So that is 1945, a huge and revolutionary moment in international law, because it is the first time in human history that a rule is adopted which basically says the power of the state is not unlimited. Human beings, whether as individuals or groups, have rights under international law. Before then, the state could basically do whatever it wanted to its citizens. And that's a big issue right now, because of course the move towards taking back power, making America great again, other developments, I would personally include things like Brexit, are essentially about undoing the settlement of 1945 and reintegrating a system of absolute power for the sovereign. That's essentially the position that we are in now in terms of the resonance of these issues. What happened next? In 1948, the, largely because of the efforts of Raphael Lemkin, a convention was adopted on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. And that was the first modern international human rights treaty. And it provided in its Article 9, in the event of a dispute between two states, for access to the International Court of Justice in The Hague to resolve disputes about the interpretation and application of the convention. There was no parallel convention on crimes against humanity. One is being negotiated right now, but it is stuck in the United Nations General Assembly with opposition from a significant number of states, having seen what has happened as a consequence of the genocide convention. Nor, interestingly, is there access to the International Court of Justice for uh, crimes committed in relation to the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and their protocols of 1977, essentially in relation to war crimes. This I'll come back to momentarily. The only way a state can have access to raise arguments that violations of war crimes or crimes against humanity or genocide can be raised is by characterizing the act as an act of genocide. And that is one of the reasons we are where we are now. There was also adopted, if you remember, some of you will, that on the same moment as the Genocide Convention of 1948, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, which is the origins of our modern system of international human rights and the European Convention on Human Rights. So this was an absolutely critical moment that arose because of the war, 
because of the Second World War. This is what gave rise to all of these developments. What happened next? Basically, in relation to crimes against humanity and genocide, nothing for 50 years. There were no cases, there were no international disputes, there were no major, uh, if you like, media-type considerations of either crimes against humanity or genocide. What changed was in 1993 and 1994, the collapse of the former Yugoslavia and the terrible conflict in Rwanda. And it happened to occur at the very moment when following the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Security Council, in a remarkably short period of two or three years, was able to adopt very far-reaching resolutions. Two of the resolutions that they adopted were to create international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. And what was integrated into the statutes of those two tribunals were the crimes of war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. And for the first time, we had statutes creating tribunals which began to hear claims of allegations of crimes against humanity violations and genocide violations. And that's why in the 1990s, all of a sudden, these two concepts came back to the forefront, coupled with the creation of the International Criminal Court, whose statute was adopted in July 1998 in Rome, which included war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and the crime of aggression. Which brings us, of course, to the modern era right now. And of course, as many of you will know, the crime of genocide has emerged as, in the eyes of many people, the crime of crimes. One of the reasons that has happened, in my view, is that genocide is the only way you can get interstate cases to international courts, to the International Court of Justice. And so that has meant the range of cases that have come before the International Court of Justice has grown. There was the Bosnia case against Serbia in 1993, the Croatia case against Serbia in 1999, the Gambia case against Myanmar more recently in 2019, and then, of course, the case filed by South Africa against Israel this year in January, alleging genocide in relation to what's going on in Gaza, joined a few weeks later by a case brought by Nicaragua against Germany, alleging that Germany has been complicit in a genocide that has occurred in Gaza or that is underway in Gaza right now. So the issue of genocide is extremely current. I'm counsel in a number of those cases. I'm including Gambia versus Myanmar. I'm not involved in the South Africa-Israel case, but I am counsel in the parallel case at the International Court of Justice uh, involving the request for an advisory opinion from the UN General Assembly on the legality or illegality of the occupation by Israel of the occupied Palestinian territories uh, on the West Bank and in relation to East Jerusalem. And so for obvious reasons, I'm going to be quite discreet on what I say about that case and cases that are pending. But that doesn't mean I can say nothing at all. Genocide, as defined in the 1948 Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, is defined differently from the way in which Raphael Lemkin originally defined it in 1944. To paraphrase, Lemkin's historical research was premised on the view that genocides were more or less a dime a dozen. On his view, if you would have a small village with nine inhabitants, three from group A, three from group B, and three from group C, and two of the groups gang up together, groups B and C, and kill the three people from group A, on Lemkin's account, that's a genocide. You are destroying a group because they happen to have the characteristics of being members of a particular group that you happen to, not to like. For Lemkin, genocide was not a numbers game, and the intention was a rather simple thing to prove. States, when they negotiated the Genocide Convention, between 1946 and 1948, were rather concerned about the floodgates. And so what they inserted 
into Articles 2 and 3 of the Genocide Convention, aside from the acts of killing and destruction and harm which are set out and listed, is a special intention that has to be proved if you're going to establish that a genocide has taken place. What you have to prove is the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. Now, to you in this room, that may seem fairly straightforward, but actually it turns out that proving what someone's intention is, is not so straightforward. The Nazis taught us that if you leave bits of paper lying around saying you intend to destroy X or Y group, you're gonna get yourself into real trouble. And so perpetrators have learned generally not to reduce into writing what is their actual intention. And so the courts have developed a practice in which the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part is to be inferred from a pattern of behavior. That is how you prove the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. And I'll say a little bit more in a moment about how you uh, infer intention from a pattern of behavior. In the case of South Africa versus Israel, which I think has in large part been misunderstood by many people who've written about it, because what has happened in pop popular consciousness is a gap has emerged between what regular folk think of as genocide, namely doing nasty things to large numbers of people because they happen to be a member of a particular group. That's the general view of what genocide is. The legal definition sets a much higher threshold. And so there is a gap between what regular folk think of as genocidal acts and what the judges at international courts think of as genocidal acts. And into that gap, a lot of mischief is made. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. Faced with a claim by South Africa in January 2024, that Israel had somehow perpetrated a genocide in relation to the Palestinians in Gaza, the International Court of Justice did what it would always do in such a case, namely determine whether on the facts, if they were established and the intention could be established, a plausible claim had been made. And the court found there was a plausible claim. But the reality is there are very few cases, I think, in which the court would not find that there is a plausible claim for the very simple reason that if they were to reject a request for provisional measures, injunctive relief, if you like, and it then turns out really nasty things are going to happen, the court is going to get a lot of egg on its face. So the finding that there is a plausible claim, for me as an international lawyer, frankly says very little. It's entirely without prejudice to what will happen five years down the line when the whole thing is litigated. And in that regard, if you read any document at all in relation to the South Africa-Israel case, read the separate opinion of the German judge, Georg Nolte, because he sets this out very clearly. It's very easy to find the decisions. You just go to the International Court of Justice website, you click on the case of South Africa, versus Nicaragua, and you then look at the provisional measures order, it's very easy to find, and read his four-page declaration, and you'll understand why it was that he voted in relation to a plausible claim. He wrote, in paragraph 13 of his uh, separate opinion, he was part of the decision in favor of voting for it, bearing all the considerations in mind, I'm not persuaded that South Africa has plausibly shown that the military operation undertaken by Israel as such is being pursued with genocidal intent. Even though I do not find it plausible that the military operation is being conducted with genocidal intent, I voted in favor of the measures indicated by the court. To indicate those measures, it's not necessary for the court to find that the military operation as such implicates plausible rights of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. My decision to vote in favor of the measures indicated rests on the plausible claim by South Africa that certain statements by Israeli state officials, including members of its military, 
give rise to a real and imminent risk of irreparable prejudice to the rights of Palestinians under the Genocide Convention on the basis that they could be characterized as direct and public incitement to commit genocide. In other words, he's drawing a distinction between the act of perpetrating a genocide and a statement which might incite a future genocide to take place. And he's saying what I find plausible is that some of those statements could be taken as incitements to genocide, not that an act of genocide is actually happening. It's obviously a hugely significant distinction, which most people, for perfectly sensible reasons, have completely not thought about. Nolte also reminds us, this is a paragraph eight of his statement, it's important to bear in mind, he writes, that the essential characteristic of genocide Distinguishing it from other criminal acts, for example, crimes against humanity and war crimes, is the existence of an intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. And then he goes on. And I've experienced this to my bitter cost acting for various countries. The court has established a high threshold for the definite determination of genocidal intent at the stage of the merits. In the absence of a general plan to this effect, he writes, the intent to destroy in whole or in part a protected group can only be inferred from a pattern of conduct, and now we get to the key words, if this is the only reasonable inference that can be drawn therefrom. And therein lies the difficulty and the challenge. If you have more than one intent, some people will say that the only reasonable inference requirement cannot be met, which means that if you can show your actions are motivated by the desire to act in self-defense, to stop rockets coming in, or to rescue hostages, or something or other, the genocidal intent that has to be established cannot be established on some views of what the court has done. And that's why, taking Lindsay's statement, when one reads the word genocide being used, for an international lawyer, we sort of pause and think, okay, they're using it in a political sense, just as President Biden did in April 2022, when he described what had happened at Butcher as looking like a genocide. The New York Times asked me to write an op-ed piece, which I did, to explain precisely what I'm talking about with you today, and to make the point that what he, from a non-legal perspective, would see as genocidal, an international lawyer would characterize very differently because judges are stuck with the convention. Countries have decided to set the threshold very high, and judges have then pushed the threshold even higher. Why? because they don't want to open the floodgates. If you put yourself in the position of the judges at the International Court of Justice, if they open the door to certain claims and allow a finding of genocide on the merits to be found, then they're going to be concerned there's gonna be a raft of cases in which really nasty things happen in war which are gonna be recharacterized as genocide. So that's the reality of the situation in which we find ourselves. Against that background, let me just make three points by way of final conclusion. Firstly, the issue of hierarchy. Just to be very clear, for me as an international lawyer, I don't think of genocide as the crime of crimes. I don't think of genocide as worse than crimes against humanity or war crimes. If 10,000 people are killed, whether you put the label of War crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, I think matters not a jot. It's a terrible thing. And we've got ourselves into this mess in relation to the characterization of crimes. Not because what happened in 1945 was malign or malicious, but because no one ever really thought through the consequences of what the establishment of these different crimes would do in relation to creating a hierarchy. If you ask prosecutors at the Yugoslav Tribunal 
or the Rwanda Tribunal, or the International Criminal Court, or any other internationalized criminal tribunal, they will say to you, every victim wants their crime to be treated as the worst of crimes. And victims consider that genocide is the worst of crimes. Now, why that has happened is a complex issue. But what it means is that when the International Court of Justice rules in 2007 that Serbia was not responsible for perpetrating a genocide in Srebrenica or in relation to Bosnia, but was only responsible for a failure to prevent others from perpetrating a genocide, namely paramilitary groups, and that the acts of Serbia are best characterized as being responsible for crimes against humanity, the newspapers in Belgrade run with headlines that say, it's only crimes against humanity, we are innocent. For reasons that are complex and unhappy, if an American president says that a genocide is happening somewhere in the world, every newspaper will run on its front page with that story. If an American president says it's a war crime or a crime against humanity, the newspapers will pass in silence. Why has that happened? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves. The second point I would make is in relation to proof. The courts, all international courts, have set an incredibly high threshold for proving genocide as a matter of international law, not the public definition of genocide. And they've made it very difficult to establish genocide in the context of a military conflict because of this only reasonable inference type of argument. And I have tried in the Croatia versus Serbia case to make the argument that the court should lower the threshold, sort of regularize the crime of genocide, to make it, if you like, part of a living, real treaty. The judges rejected that argument. Recently, Ireland, just a few weeks ago, indicated it was going to intervene in the case brought by South Africa against Israel precisely for the purpose of seeking to persuade the court to clarify its definition of genocide and to reduce the bar, to lower the bar, to reduce the threshold so that it becomes easier to prove that a genocide has happened. And one of the things to look out for in the case of South Africa against Israel is whether the judges decide they want to do that or they don't want to do that. That's essentially what we're looking out for. There's a third and final point that I want to make, which some of you who've read East West Street will understand because I've alluded to it and I've become more and more persuaded uh, about it. I actually now have come to the position that I begin to have doubts about whether it was a useful social thing to do to invent the concept of genocide at all. This is not a critique of Raphael Lemkin, who is a huge hero for me. He thought he was doing the best in the most difficult, the most terrible of circumstances. But I think Lauterpacht was right. I think that by, for the first time, putting in the international legal order the protection of groups as such, it has had the effect, the unintended consequences of reinforcing intergroup hatred, reinforcing the sense of identity, and actually giving rise to the situation that the invention of the concept of genocide may actually give rise to more genocides than may actually have happened. I've seen for myself in litigating cases, and Lindsay, you must have seen this also, that when it comes to the obligation to prove that an act of genocide has happened, the victim group unites and comes to see itself as being the target of the perpetrator group, and the negative feelings towards the perpetrator group become even stronger, and the negative feelings of the perpetrator group to the victim group become even stronger. It reinforces through a complex psychological process the sense of group identity. And as group identity is reinforced, the capacity to do harm to other groups in order to protect your own group is also reinforced and gives rise to the very conditions, I fear, that Raphael Lemkin wanted to avoid. And so we're in this 
really curious situation in which well-intentioned objectives in 1945 may have actually given rise to the kinds of situations they were intended to avoid. And we've all seen that in the last few weeks. The use of the term genocide inflames passions on all sides in ways that we can see in our newspapers, on our screens, every day. Is it a useful concept? And that brings me back to the writing of East West Street and what happened in Lviv in that period in the 1910s, the 1920s, and the 1930s. The beating heart of this whole story, the different types of crimes, goes to the issue of who we are and how we want the law to protect us. And this is something that touches every single person in this room. We're all individuals, but we're also all members of a group, many groups. Do we want the law to protect us because of our individual human qualities, living sentient beings, individuals? Or do we want the law to protect us because we are a member of one or more groups? And that's a very complicated question which causes in each of us to reflect, and we will all come to our own particular answers. But the beating heart of the issue of the characterization of crimes in the context of war is essentially a fundamental question of human identity and how we wish to define ourselves. Let me stop there, and let's go back to Lindsay and your questions. Thank you so much for your attention. So thank you very much, Philippe. You, you, you've slightly ruined my world in a number of ways there. First of all, I was in The Hague for um, the ICJ case, and now I'm really, really worried that I reported it wrongly um, over several days, because I didn't actually pick out, OK, don't tell anybody else, but I didn't really sort of concentrate on what the German judge said. But that's just between us. Don't, don't tell anyone, OK? Um, but this thing about, so I was in Rwanda, right? I've been in Darfur. I can't believe that the fact that Raphael Lemkin came up with the concept of genocide had an impact on the Hutus who murdered their Tutsi neighbors and the, their, the Hutu leadership, or on the rapid support forces in Darfur now who are driving the Marsalit, who are an African tribe, into into Chad, surely. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm not for a moment saying that the invention of these concepts caused any of those people to do what they did. The, the point that I'm trying to raise is the creation of the differences of the hierarchies gives rise to additional tensions. Let me give you a clear example. You know very well, you were also in Yugoslavia. You know that at Srebrenica, a group of Serb paramilitaries killed about 8,000 uh, Bosnian Muslim men, and the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and the International Court of Justice characterized that as a genocide. At around the same time, smaller numbers, but nevertheless just as nasty, in Vukovar, hundreds of Croats were killed by essentially the same paramilitary organizations. And the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and the International Court of Justice said, yes, terrible, etc., etc., but it's not a genocide, it's just crimes against humanity, or maybe war crimes. So put yourself in the position of the Croats. They are incandescent. Why did the Bosnians get a genocide and we only got a crime against humanity? And that has reinforced the sense of conflict between the communities, reinforced the sense of anger, and you ask yourself the question, why is that a socially useful thing? to create anger in one community because the other community got something else that you actually wanted. I can give you another example. I served on the Academic Advisory Council of the International Holocaust Memorial Day Trust in the United Kingdom, a wonderful organization, in particular because it takes International Holocaust Memorial Day as a moment to mark other acts of mass killing. And so I asked rather innocently at the first event, well, how do you choose the other acts? There's so many to choose from. And they said, oh, we've got a, we've got a formula provided by the Foreign Office. 
once you hear those words, you, of course, know that something will be going on. And they say, yes, yes, the Foreign Office has come up with this fantastic formula. And the formula is, one, it has to have happened after 1945. Excellent. That means everything that happened before 1945, enslavement, colonialism, whatever you want to call it, that's all. We're off the hook for all of that. You know, the, Ar the Armenians, the Armenians that's, yes. we can't deal with any of that. And the second thing is, an international criminal tribunal must have characterized the act as genocide. So I said, well, hang on. Does that mean, therefore, you will mark the killing of 8,000 people in Srebrenica in Bosnia, but you will pass in silence on the killing of three million people in the Democratic Republic of Congo at around the same time, because it's only a crime against humanity, and the answer is yes. To which the obvious position is, why is that a socially useful thing to do? Why do you put some people on some sort of a pedestal, and other people you say, well, no, we're just gonna pass in silence on those people. So what we really sort of have to think about is, the utility and the consequence of using these legal terms in ways that have given rise to so much ill feeling. I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about, because I'm finding this fascinating, and I think I don't really understand how the crime of genocide uh, came to be seen as so much worse as crime, crimes against humanity and war crimes. Because in my work, you know, I see all of it, right? I see all of it. But yes, I am aware of, of that, as I think we all are, that, that, that genocide is the crime, you know, the crime of crimes. Is that because of what happened in the Holocaust and because that has had so many ramifications? Is it, why is it? It's a huge question, Lindsay. It's an excellent question. So one thing that's curious, most people don't realize is that actually the Nuremberg Tribunal did not call what happened to the Jews a genocide. They declined to do that. They called it a crime against humanity, they called it war crimes, they didn't call it genocide. So that particular answer seems not right. My sense, but it's no more than that, is that it rests on two things. Firstly, the terms war crimes and crimes against humanity sort of have a technical, legalistic, they don't, when you think about them, you know, people go, what's that exactly? Genocide has a quality to it as a word that Lemkin understood. I found the pieces of paper in which he, he wrote out all his possible terms for characterizing it, and he settled on this term. And I think that one of the reasons that he settled on this term was as someone with a background in linguistics, he understood the power of words. He understood that this term evokes a different reaction. And the second thing that I think is related but this is for each of you to work out for yourselves, is that somehow, if you were to take two acts of killing, one is an act of killing of 10,000 people, which is not motivated by the focus on those people as a group, i.e. a group of, indiv they're just individuals, and then compare that with the same act in relation to 10,000 people because they're the member of the same group, that generates in a lot of people a sense of anger, greater anger, even greater anger, a sense of group identity. I felt this myself. Those of you who've read East West Street will know that in the sense the entire book is a struggle internally with myself. Am I with Lauter Pact or am I with Lemkin? And to be very clear, intellectually, I'm 100% with Lauter Pact. I think we should focus on all human beings having rights because they're human beings. And then right at the end of the book, on the very last page, I get more letters about the last page than about anything else I've ever written. I go to a mass grave in a small town called Zhulkiev outside Lviv, 25 kilometers from Lviv. And there is a secret mass grave containing the bodies of 3,500 people. Jews from the town of Zhulkiev, all killed on a single day, the 25th of March, 1943 because they were Jews. And in that mass grave, still there today, unmarked, are the families of Lauterpacht and my grandfather's family. And I can tell you just being there, it's impossible not to feel a sense of kinship with the people who are there because of 
a characteristic they had that happens to be the same characteristic that I have. And that, whether it's biological, whether it's psychological, whether it's something else, cuts in. The moment we are finding ourselves in connection with human beings who are bonded by a particular connection like that, we can associate with that in different ways, and I think it has a psychological effect. And I think the answer to your question rests somewhere between those two aspects. That's really interesting. The other thing I didn't quite understand in what you said was when you were talking about the South Africa Israel case, which is before the International Court of Justice at the moment, you said that the judges could lower the standard of proof. I don't quite understand how in international law they can do that, how those judges have the authority to change the, um, the sort of level of, uh, of evidence that's needed. They, if they were to do that, they, they wouldn't say that's what they're doing. They would say they are like an English court or the US Supreme Court coming back on an interpretation in relation to abortion or anything else. We'll say we're, we're, we're just interpreting the constitution, the treaty, the legislation, the convention in accordance with the current values of today. They have set a very high standard. The only reasonable inference is the intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. So one thing they could do would be to clarify that what they don't mean by that is it's the only intention or the only underlying motive. In other words, as we all know in life from our own experiences, we do things often for a range of reasons, good things and not so good things. It's very rare for us to do something exclusively because of one thing. And so what they could do is say, no, 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 in the judgments in Bosnia and the judgments in Croatia, we didn't mean it's the only intention. It is possible, they could say, very clearly, which they haven't done so far, you could have two intentions. You could have the intention to act in self-defense and then rather conveniently alongside the intention of acting in self-defense is the opportunity to get rid of a particular group in whole or in part. And I think that if they were to do that, they would lower the threshold. The reasons for them not to do that is that if they do that, they risk whenever there is a conflict between, and you know better than anyone else probably in the world, the propensity of groups to take each other on, every armed conflict, every war could also become genocidal in character. And, and I mean, I feel a lot of sympathy for the judges. That they've been given this sort of ambiguous text, drafted in great haste in 1948, not really thought through as to what all the consequences will be. It falls to them to interpret it, and they're damned if they do, and they're damned if they don't, and someone's going to criticize them, whatever they do, and they act as a collective themselves of 15 judges trying to interpret this wretched treaty in a way that can do justice, won't open the floodgates, etc., etc. So being an international judge against the background of these kinds of cases is rather complex. And before I throw it open, one other thing. I mean, you used quite a big phrase near the beginning about these, these laws being there to protect people. And yet we, I think we all look around the world today and we see many terrible things, don't we? And we see wars and we see a lot of horror and a lot of atrocities. Do they protect people? Well, the, um, we, don't, we don't have empirical evidence. Um, I, I'm yet to come across a president or a prime minister who says, I'm not going to do this particular act because I might get caught by the genocide convention. I don't think that's how it works, although many actors will take advice and frame what they're doing, whether it's Putin or Netanyahu or Hamas or anyone else, they always seek to justify what they do in accordance with international law. But I think the best answer I can give you to that, why I think ultimately warts and all, it's better today than it was in 1939, is the following anecdote. So the, 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 the Gambia-Myanmar case was argued for provisional measures in December 2019. 
And a month before, I went to Washington and I was at an academic conference uh, at George Washington University. And I shared a panel... Can I just stop you one minute? Because some people may not be familiar. Can you just explain briefly the Gambia-Myanmar case and why Gambia could yes. take Myanmar to the yes. International Court of Justice? Because not everybody may be familiar so with that. So there is a community in Myanmar known as the Rohingya, a Muslim community, not recognized as a group, not given identity in the law of Myanmar, targeted... I'm counsel for the Gambia, so bear in mind that when I say what I'm about to say, but targeted by the Tat Mador, the army of Myanmar founded by the father of Aung San Suu Kyi, and subjected to really horrendous stuff, which various UN bodies have characterized as being genocidal attacks. The Gambia brings a case to the International Court of Justice. You may ask yourself, why on earth would the Gambia bring a case to the International Court of Justice? It's thousands of miles away in Africa. It happened because its attorney general was invited by the Organization of Islamic States to visit Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, you've probably been, I've been, I've been. Where, where many of the Rohingya had fled from Myanmar over the border into Bangladesh. And they, um, in can I explain? Uh, member states of the International Court of Justice can bring other member states to the court. That's yes. the basis of yes. it. Sorry, go on. And so the Attorney General goes to Cox's Bazaar, starts talking to people, asks them, you know, what happened to you exactly? I'm sort of interested to know. Now, the thing you need to know about the then Attorney General, who's a wonderful person, and is my former student and who then went on to be a prosecutor at the Rwanda Tribunal. And as he said to me, I know a genocide when I see one. And the stories they were telling me were acts of genocide. And so I persuaded my government to bring a case to the International Court of Justice. Very often, it's one of the big themes in everything that I write, it's not about what states do, it's about what individuals do. And this is one individual who did a remarkable thing. Anyway, back anyway, to Washington. Anyway, go on, so your anecdote. So, so I'm, I'm on a panel in Washington with a wonderful, wonderful human being called Tom Bergenthal. Tom Bergenthal had been the American judge at the International Court of Justice. But many decades earlier, as a 10-year-old boy in Poland, he was at Auschwitz, and he was in the care of Dr. Joseph Mengele. He was one of those few children who survived. And he wrote, incidentally, if you're interested in his story, a magnificent book called A Lucky Child. Tom, sadly, is no longer with us, but that book is with us, and run, don't walk. It's an extraordinary story uh, describing his journey. And he said to me, Philippe, could you imagine if in 1944, when I was in Auschwitz, a faraway country from Germany had gone to a faraway international court of justice bearing a piece of paper which said, you can't treat these children in this way. Perhaps it wouldn't have stopped it. In fact, he said, I'm sure it wouldn't have stopped it, but it would have given us hope. And that is not nothing. And one of the most extraordinary images I've ever seen after the International Court of Justice ordered provisional measures that were very far-reaching in relation to the Gambia-Myanmar case, ordering acts to stop compared to South Africa, Israel, where the court did not order Israel to stop its actions. That's the crucial point about that case. And we were then sent photographs from Cox's Bazaar of hundreds and hundreds of people in the refugee camps and in Myanmar holding up placards, handwritten, which simply said, thank you, the Gambia. And, and when you see an image like that, you can find it for yourselves, they're, all, they're on the web, you think to yourself, okay, it's not perfect, the international legal order, it has lots of problems, it's not effective very often, but it gives people hope. And that, I think, is really important. That's a really, really good point. Now, listen, I have um, abused my position and asked too many questions, so we only have 15 minutes for your questions, which is very, very rude of me. So, and I would um, say questions, uh, not statements, and no ranting. I'm really, really not nice to people who rant. Um, 
There's a lady at the back there in the middle, yes, with the... Um, well, the two microphones are coming for you at the same time. Yes, la lady Thanks. at the back, yes. Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. In reference to your latest book, The, La the Last Colony, <clears throat> about the theft of the Chagos Islands, I call it a theft by the British government, um, and they were turned into an American air base called Diego Garcia. What interests me there is, throughout the book, the case sort of keeps coming back to court or back to an advisory opinion of judges, and every single time, the British government are told, you have to give the islands back, you have to make, remake them into part of Mauritius. The British government just said, no, we're not going to do that. So given that, is it worth bothering with any of these laws and rulings? Yeah. Because there are governments, particularly our own, who just pay no attention. That's right. I'm going to take a couple of questions at a time. So that one is um, Diego Garcia. Yes. Um, let's take the gentleman just near, near her. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, I was just wondering whether you've observed any difference over time between potentially collective, sorry, collectivist societies and more Western individualistic societies. And I'm wondering whether as the atomization of the individual happens, as everyone gets more connected, whether actually the pendulum may swing the other way, where actually crimes against humanity starts to, mm. I guess, elevate in the hierarchy of well, that's crimes. Interesting. That's a sort of futurism sort of question. We're going to take one more. Is there any, I'm particularly keen for some of the young people over here in the back to ask questions, and you shouldn't feel shy because we're not scary people. Okay, think about it, and, if, and in the next round, I'll come to you. So think about your questions and we'll come to you. But let me take one more here. I'm going to take this gentleman in the second row here. Yes, she's coming for you. Yes. Um, it seems that it's basically impossible to successfully prosecute <clears throat> for the crime of genocide, yet mm -hmm. it retains this political and emotive, or these political and emotive dimensions, which means, yes, it might give hope, but a crime against humanity is still a serious crime. Is it not the responsibility of international lawyers to actually prosecute for things that you can successfully prosecute for, which are crimes against humanity, and to educate the international community that that is such a serious crime and it can be successfully prosecuted, and to do that more often? Very good. Okay, three questions. Let me just take the last two questions together because I think they're actually connected. So just by way of fact... In 2019, the United Nations International Law Commission finalized, adopted a draft convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity, a parallel convention to the Genocide Convention. The essential difference between the two is that on crimes against humanity, you don't have to prove that special intention. It's all you have to prove, all, it's still quite a lot, is the destruction of human beings on a widespread, individuals on a widespread, civilians on a widespread and systematic basis. So when you take out of the equation that special intent, which is so difficult to prove, it's much, much easier. So the ILC adopts that convention. It takes them 50 years, basically, to negotiate it because largely states don't want They've seen what's happened with genocide convention. They don't want another convention. It's now made its way to the United Nations, and I was there just two weeks ago at the latest round of negotiations, which will decide in October whether to move formally to the negotiation and adoption of a parallel convention to genocide. The overwhelming number of states now support that initiative, and interestingly, the uh, terrible events in uh, Ukraine and in Israel on the 7th of October and in Gaza subsequently have reinforced and heightened the desire of states to move to the adoption of a convention which would, if you like, create a second and much easier basis for addressing acts of horror. It is being held up by a group of countries that are taking advantage of the system of proceeding by consensus. China, Russia, Iran, Israel, India. Five main countries acting to stop it. I'm very pleased to say that the UK and the US 
are on board, although not without serious anxieties of the convention being used against them. So I'm hopeful that in October there will be a decision to move to a formal negotiation of a convention. And once that convention is adopted and in force, I think if it works as it should work, some of the steam will come out of the focus on genocide and the parallel crime of crimes against humanity might begin to enter public consciousness. And, and that's that a response. And does that fit in with what the gentleman there was yes. saying? Now, in relation to Diego Garcia and Chagos and Las Colas, I'm going to surprise you by what I say, because, in fact, there has been a very significant change. In September 2022, the British government changed its position and announced that it would move to negotiations with Mauritius to resolve the issues around the Chagos archipelago on the basis of international law. And those negotiations have been underway and may soon or not reach a fruitful conclusion. I'm a participant in those negotiations, so I can't say anything about them. But there has been a change, and I want to give real credit to the United Kingdom, and I'm going to really surprise you, because the person who deserves the credit for that is the Prime Minister who had the shortest tenure in the oh, United no. Kingdom. Oh, my God. Liz Truss. Oh, my God, it was the lettuce. On day number two of her premiership, announced a change of position. Now, there are lots of complicated reasons for why that happened, but we should give her credit, and she is the one Theresa May having said no, we're sitting two thumbs up at the International Court of Justice, Boris Johnson having stuck four fingers up at the International Court of Justice, Theresa, Liz Truss then said no, we're going to sort this out. And so I would simply say watch this space. And that is the kind of scenario that does give one hope. It's true that in my world there's a lot to be downcast about, particularly now. I think we're in a very dangerous moment but you take hope where you can get it. And I think what I would ask all of you to imagine is that this is a long game. This is not, you know, when you're going to change the world by adopting new rules in 1945, it's not going to change overnight. I take my cue from another wonderful character, the retired professor of English legal history at Cambridge University, Sir John Baker, who, when I was a young academic, would sort of invite me in and say, oh, what are you working on, Philippe? International law, blah, blah, blah. And I'd tell him what I was working on, and he'd stroke his little beard, and he'd say, oh, yes, we had a problem like that in English law in 1472, and it took 285 years to sort it out. <laughs> and that's sort of where we are in international law. It's the beginning of a long game. Well, I have to say, Philippe, that you've turned my world upside down <laughs> twice now. I mean, first of all, with not being so keen on genocide and then Liz Truss. Oh, my God, I might have to go and lie down. Um, do we have any questions from over here? I live in hope. I live in... Yay. Yes, a lady at the back. Um, so you mentioned how um, attitudes of modern politicians like making America great again and Brexit are kind of weakening the 1945 um, Nuremberg judgment. And I was just wondering um, what kind of threat you think this poses to us and if you think that there is enough in place to protect us as individuals. Yeah, good question. Enough to protect us as individuals. There. Any other questions from over there? Or Okay, let me move. Okay, we've got a lot here. And I actually haven't had any from this side yet. So do we have any... Is this the silent side? This is the silent side. So, um, who have we got there? I think there's, is there a lady there um, in sort of near the back? Yeah? Yeah. Um, th this will demonstrate my complete incapacity to get my mind around what you've said. So you can contest That's all right. It. We're all struggling. Um, but I think, could you explain why, for instance, if we took India um, and what's happening in India around Muslims isn't individual, it is in fact that they are a group. Mm. And the, what we're looking at is not, nothing to do with law, though law is being used against them, but to do with the political weaponization right. of group identity. And I really can't understand why that isn't something we shouldn't seek 
But that's not as part of a war. So it's a slightly different thing. But, but, but it might can well explain be. that. It's not it part well of a war. It's a slightly different thing. But yes, it's a very, very good question. Um, and we're going to take this gentleman here. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to make the life of the ladies with the microphones as difficult as possible. Yes. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my reporting and filmmaking has taken me a lot to Ukraine over the mm -hmm. last two years, including for the great Lindsay Hilson's marvelous channel, Channel 4 News. Um, my question is therefore Ukraine related, and I must say a thought-provoking talk tonight brought to mind a lot of the wonderful people and the terrible scenes that I've seen there over the last two years. Um, President Putin um, charged, uh, accused of crimes against humanity about a year ago. Um, what are the prospects of convicting him? And what are the pragmatic steps that can be taken to yep. make that happen? Very good question. So we've got Russia, Putin, we've got India, and we've got MAGA, Brexit, the unraveling of the system yeah. and what that means for the future. So I, I'm going to start with the first question. I, I'm so glad you asked that question because you are part of that generation that is going to have to address what's going on right now. And you have a big responsibility in that regard. But I know from my own children and their friends and their school friends that you're a fantastic generation and you are completely up to it. And the thing you need to be asking yourself is... However imperfect that moment in 1945 was, and we know it was imperfect, what's the alternative? The alternative is essentially back to the system that existed before, of unbridled, unlimited power of the state to treat its citizens as it wished. You, you probably wouldn't know, and you probably don't even believe what I'm about to say to you, but before 1939, as a matter of international law, not domestic law, as a matter of international law, if a government said, right, I'm going to divide this room in half, and tomorrow, everyone on this side of the room is going to be executed. International law had nothing to say about that. The citizen was the property of the state, like a chicken. You could do whatever you wanted. And the revolution of the 1945 moment was that it said, no, these people like these people, have rights as individuals and as members of a group. Not by operation of domestic law, but by operation of international law. And so the thing for you to think about is what system do you want? Do you want a system in which the power of the state is unbridled, or do you want a system in which there are limits? And the difficulty with limits is it raises questions about democracy and accountability and who are these legislators and who are these international judges and those are legitimate questions but what's the alternative and right now this country is on the cusp you may not have focused on it but in relation to a place called Rwanda and a decision adopted this week to send people on planes to Rwanda who may have come to this country illegally, the British Parliament has crossed a line and brought itself into manifest violation of international law and has told the British judges they can't do anything about it and has told its own civil servants that if they get an instruction from the European Court of Human Rights not to participate in this system, they must ignore that ruling. The reason that is so painful for me is that the British government in 1950 played a greater role than any other government in giving Europe a European Convention on Human Rights. And we now have a government with a prime minister who has said he's open to the possibility of taking the United Kingdom out of the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, the European Convention on Human Rights is not perfect, and the in European Court of Human Rights is not perfect, but it's for your generation to get active on whether you want people to have rights under international law as individuals or as members of a group or not. That's the challenge for your generation. It's both exciting and it's daunting, but the fact that you ask that question thrills me, and I thank you for asking that question. Very good. So we've now got India, 
Putin, and then we have to come to an close. Uh, I mean, I mean, I India is the reason what you describe is the reason India is opposed to a convention on crimes against humanity. They don't want international scrutiny of what is going on in their country right now. It's as simple as that. Up until this moment, up until this government, Indian governments were actively involved in supporting international initiatives on accountability. In my experience, this is the first time on an instrument like this that the Indian government has joined with these other governments and that reflects exactly what it is that you are talking about. In a sense, looking at these international instruments is a way of looking at the battle lines that are being drawn and raise the question, apropos the last question, the, the first question that was asked, to what extent and how do we want to internationalize our system and subject ourselves, whether we are Indian or whether we are from Myanmar or Gambia or the UK or anywhere else, to some degree of international scrutiny? And so that issue is part, I think, of this issue, not least since it is obviously very closely connected to events going back to partition and even earlier in relation to the history of those situations. The, the question in relation to Ukraine, it's, I mean, we could spend hours here talking about Ukraine. We can link Ukraine to genocide in many ways. Some of you will remember when Vladimir Putin made his television address to explain, announce, justify what he was doing in Ukraine, that he was about to invade Ukraine, he said, I'm doing it to stop a genocide taking place in the Donbass, in the eastern Ukraine. Ukraine actually subsequently went to the International Court of Justice and got a ruling that there is no plausible basis for that argument. And so that became a genocide issue. My friends in Ukraine, my friends in Lviv, one dear friend in particular who is no longer with us, you will know her story, Victoria Amelina, who was killed in a pizzeria, targeted because she happened to be sitting next to you know, out of hours, Ukrainian military. The local Ukrainian who gave the Russian military the coordinates for that restaurant has just been sentenced to life imprisonment. She and I had a debate in Lviv six months before she died. She is a remarkable person, and I look back on that conversation that she and I had, which is being turned into a book, actually, in the coming months. She tried to persuade me that what was happening in Ukraine was a genocide, that the Russians were perpetrating a genocide because they were denying the existence of Ukrainians to exist as Ukrainians in an independent state. And looking back, it's rather painful because I went through the same analysis that I've gone through tonight to try to explain it's gonna be, be impossible to prove in law that what Russia is doing in Ukraine is a genocide. War crimes, yes. Crimes against humanity, almost certainly. But genocide, because of this intent issue, very, very difficult to prove. The only way I think you can really get to Putin is not through war crimes, crimes against humanity, or genocide. It's the crime of aggression. And that was why, after the war began, I proposed in an article in the FT the creation of a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression, because the International Criminal Court doesn't have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. That project is up and running, and a group of about 45, 50 states have agreed they want to create a special criminal tribunal on the crime of aggression in relation to Ukraine, but they have split between a large number of smaller countries, these are European Western countries, who want a full-on Nuremberg-style international tribunal, and then the more powerful French, British, and Americans who worry that if you create a special criminal tribunal of a full international kind in relation to Ukraine, if you create a special criminal tribunal for one permanent member today, you might create another one for another permanent member tomorrow, i.e. us, want a sort of lesser model of a sort of Ukrainian court based in The Hague type of thing. You've probably been following it. The International Criminal Court has publicly indicted Vladimir Putin. Personally, I think the way they did it was a big mistake. I think my view is that it was done to head off 
the possibility of a special criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression, because the ICC prosecutor is against that, not for reasons of principle, but for reasons of turf. He doesn't want some competitor institution. It upsets me greatly to have to say that. And so what they have done is they've gone against Putin for a war crime of the deportation of children. Now look, as a parent, deporting children is a terrible thing. But in the scheme of horrors in relation to Ukraine, I think you'll agree it is not top of the list in terms of the horrors. And the big mistake I think that the ICC has done was to do that indictment publicly. If they're going to indict him for something, they should have done what they did in relation to Yugoslavia, Milosevic, Tuchman, and others. We don't know all of the details, but indict them secretly. So you don't know. But they wanted the full glare of publicity, and I think they've now got themselves into a great stinking mess because having publicly indicted Vladimir Putin, what the prosecutor now has in his intray is what on earth do we do with Israel and Gaza? I think, Philippe, we're going to have to leave it there. We get That's a real question. I'm just going to finish on one thing. You mentioned Victoria Amelina. Victoria Amelina was a poet. She wrote an extraordinary poem, which I don't know off by heart, but I can tell you what it said. It's a poem about what it's like to live in a war zone when there are missiles coming into your town. And it's about how you hear them, and then you hear the news, and it's not you, not you this time. And then, of course, it was her. And that is why all of this is so important. What Philippe has been saying to us tonight is so important. Because we think of war and war crimes and genocide and all of these things as something that happens, to coin a phrase, in far-off countries of which we know little. This is part of our world, the world that is coming to you over here. That is why it is so important that it should not be left to lawyers, why it's incumbent on all of us to understand these terms and to understand what is at stake. So I would like you to join me and you who are listening online as well to join me in thanking Philippe Sands for this extraordinary lecture at the Imperial Union. The theatre where they, you want an encore. <laughs> <laughs>